Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, again for coming back after, uh, after a great break. And uh, General Sullivan and the team at AUSA, thank you for setting up a forum which uh, has focused energy and interest across not only industry and academia, but certainly in our Department of Defense and more, more importantly, our, our Army. I uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to introduce these great panel members. members. As, uh, as General Swan said, we have a, a, a wonderful blend of very bright people. Uh, that represent different uh, aspects of cyber uh, from the industry side, from academia, from small businesses uh, to the military side. Uh, but one common denominator is a passion uh, to help our Army and to help our nation uh, in the field of cyber. Uh, our leadoff batter is going to be uh, Second Army Commander and Army Cyber Commanding General, Lieutenant General Ed Cardone. Not a lot of introduction necessary here, uh, but I will say that uh, General Cardone has commanded the 2nd Infantry Division on the frontiers of freedom in Korea. He served on the S-4 staff in the Balkans. And since 2003, he's been deployed not once, not twice, not three times, but four major tours to Iraq, tough leadership positions. And I know a lot of the lessons learned in cyber will be tucked away from those great assignments. So General Cardone, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here on this team. Next to him, or not next to him, uh, not in any necessary order here, but I'll introduce next uh, Major General George Franz. And uh, George is our uh, premier intelligence force, Army's Intelligence and Security Command's commanding general. General Franz has tremendous experience directing intelligence operations, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. And like General Cardone, you can see that evidence by the hash marks on their right sleeves. Each of those hash marks represents six months deployed in a hostile combat zone serving their nation. Now, perhaps uh, General Franz's more unique contribution, to, though, is writing a SAMS monograph back in 1996 about cyber before the t term was actually in vogue. George, it's great to have you on the team, and congratulations on taking uh, uh, INSCOM. General Franz is going to underscore the importance of better understanding of cyber operations, intel in support of cyber operations, and cyber in support of unified land operations and strategic land power. From Fort Bragg, we have Brigadier General Mike Torello. He's the Deputy Commanding General for the United States Army Special Forces Command. And as such, he is our premier snake eater on the panel. Special Forces Command uh, in general organizes, equips, trains, validates, and deploys active duty and reserve components, special forces, Green Berets, if you will, soldiers to conduct special operations across the spectrum of conflict. They do that in support of SOCOM. Just as importantly, they do that in, in support of the regional combatant commanders, and they also do it for American ambassadors and other government agencies <coughs> as directed. As our snake eater, uh, Mike is going to address USASOC's operational experience uh, in austere and resource-constrained environments, very important today as we look at the strategic landscape. So you're thinking in terms of places like denied areas or AFRICOM, AO, or other places. He'll look at the command and control models, the people, the technical capabilities, and provide some meaningful effects upon the untethered from operational to strategic assets. Every panel has to have a 100 pound head and, and although I would classify each of these panel members in that, we have a very, very special one in Dr. Randy Garrett, who's the program manager at DARPA's Information Innovation Office. Randy has a PhD in computer engineering and undergraduate degrees from MIT in physics and mathematics. As such, he's a rare commodity in our nation today. He has many accolades, but Dr. Garrett was also presented the Outstanding Civilian Service Medal from the Army and was a Federal 100 Award winner. Randy's going to discuss how cyber provides situation awareness for the commander to improve their operational decision making, manage risk, and agility. Next is Dr. Nate Fick. He's the Chief Executive Officer for Endgame. Endgame was a company founded back in 2008. They have offices in Washington, San Antonio, Melbourne, other places. But just as importantly, Nate's not only the CEO of a vibrant company, he's also a former Marine elite reconnaissance captain who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. So Nate, I thank you for your service, not only as a Marine, but as a businessman as well, because our nation's business is business. Nate's going to get to the new vulnerabilities that exist in the future force and how we ensure our military systems, command and control, mission command models allow for sufficient resilience in the face of these threats. And then finally, rounding out our panel is Mr. Jeff Johnson. Jeff serves as the coordinating partner for Ernest & Young, or EY, and their uh, cyber economic risk insight solution efforts. Uh, Jeff served, in my mind, the most important person on this panel, 
as the DFAS director for the $40 billion of military retirement programs, near and dear to all of us. Jeff, you've done a great job. I keep on getting paid on time, and I like that, <laughs> and I appreciate that. So Jeff's going to draw from his unique 30 years of experience, uh, successful operations and technology implementation to help us better understand cyber economic risk landscape and how that may be applicable to the Department of Defense and the Army, and he's going to help us provide some interesting examples of cyber economic related incidents and how this may impact the future battlefield. So with those brief introductory comments, sir, I'd like to turn it back over to you and we'll get underway. Is this on? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, well, good, good morning everyone and, and thank you for the kind introduction. And I'd first like to thank General Sullivan and AUSA for giving us this opportunity here and to uh, my partner in this endeavor, uh, Lieutenant General Farrell, thanks so much for the uh, the partnership, friction, it doesn't really matter. We work together on a common mission set that's critical to our Army. And so I, I thank you for your leadership there. Admiral Rogers, my boss, laid this out very well this morning. So I'm not going to rehash a lot of those remarks, but I want to amplify a few of those. So let me first start off with you saw that he took a very operational approach with operational commanders. And one of the reasons that is becoming, uh, as this space comes more into vogue, is operational commanders are given capabilities and authorities that they then organize in time and in space to accomplish a mission set. That has not been the way that we normally approach this effort. But if any of you went down and, down and talked to Colonel Tom Dormy at the uh, NIE that we talked about in the earlier panel, Tom Dormy absolutely maneuvers the network. He, he has to maneuver the network in order to conduct his operations. So this is already becoming apparent in the Army and the experimental side, but at the same time, at our combat training centers, we now have a cyber op for at each one. We've had them there for the last year, and the inclusion for next year, for, for, for the next year was not only a red team, but a blue team. And so as we bring this more to the forefront, you're going to see commanders get a lot more involved. The reason that this is all possible is just the tremendous growth in cyber. Since I uh, took over from Lieutenant General Red Hernandez, who did the hard work doing the startup here three years, we've had exponential levels of growth and capabilities over the last three, six, nine months. Now that's gonna slow down because it's hard to become exponential as your numbers get bigger. But I actually think it's gonna stay exponential in capabilities for the next nine months. And so we have a lot of capabilities coming online now. The question is how do we organize this to give options to combatant commanders and army commanders? General Odierno tasked us to, we're gonna be a smaller army, we've all come to grips with this, but that smaller army doesn't have to be less capable. But a huge piece of this, if you're gonna be smaller but you're better connected, it allows us to bring the right capabilities to the right place at the right time, and cyber is a huge piece of that. The challenge when you talk about 2025 though in cyber is for many in this room, you start thinking about te technology curves and you realize that's five technology curves. And so how do we know what we need in 2025? And when you heard Admiral Rogers talk, he gave an operational setup. And so when Kevin Fahey was talking, a lot of the models that we're trying to create inside the Army I describe it as we, we're working on Force 2025, but how do we create Institution 2025 to develop Force 2025? And what I mean by that is, is it, do we park just certain pieces of money that then allow us to harness the tremendous innovation going on in the private industry uh, of the United States, and I would argue in some cases globally, depending on who you talk to? Uh, into this space. We have not exactly worked that out yet. We are laying down requirements, but you almost enter this kind of surreal cone where you, you know what you have today and you can maybe see two years ahead. But then if you think two years ahead, you might see a disruptive technology, but that technology itself might be disrupted before it makes a 10-year point. And so how do we remain agility because 
Some of you saw a headline, it didn't come out right, but it said, you know, Army General wants more failure. That was me, but I didn't, it didn't come out the way I intended, right? Uh, one way to describe this is I believe we should probably have about 150 little experiments going on at any one time, of which only 10 or 15 will pan out. And if we measured our failure rate, that might be a good indicator, are we being bold enough for this space? Because right now, our, our failure rate is that's not our culture. Our culture is we create a program and we do all we can to make that program successful. And we just push on it and push on it and push on it. And maybe we need a little different model. The last thing I'll talk about here is risk. And I'm, uh, we have a great panelist to talk on this. But you often get in these description about uh, authorities. but. I apologize for some of you that have heard me talk about this before, but one of the challenges with cyber is it's very hard to articulate the risk to senior decision makers. And this deals with the legal frameworks that Admiral Rogers was talking about. If you think about kinetic effects, when I'm a division commander and you, you want to use an our artillery round or uh, Air Force bomb or whatever, we can articulate that risk to great detail excruciating detail, and there's a, a, a complete framework that has different decision-making authorities all the way up. The challenge in cyber is it's very hard to describe the risk. And so I often tell people, put yourself in a senior decision-maker's shoes, and the answers are kind of like, well, we're not really sure, maybe, possibly, uh, we're not really, of course the answer is no, because you can't articulate the risk. And so I think this is an area that we really have to continue to approach. The last thing I'll say is uh, the two areas that, that need the most work in my mind right now, so there's a lot of vectors working. One is embedded systems. We talked about this. There's a lot of work going on here, often term, in terms of embedded systems. I mean SCADA, ICS, all those type of systems, because it's the idea of going forward but looking back. And a lot of the looking back, those systems were built with no cybersecurity in mind at all. And yet we've got millions of these devices embedded throughout the Army and in, in, in our enterprise and in our formations. And how we work that in the future, that's an area that we're really gonna have to have uh, both technology and operations to help us. And then my final one is, I talked to General Farrell about this some, <coughs> call it work factor analysis. And work factor analysis is about where do we invest to get the greatest cybersecurity? Because if you look at the landscape right now, there are a lot of cybersecurity initiatives, but we don't have a good model by which we say, if we invest this, we get this level of security out of it. You know, Michelle talked about end-to-end -end encryption. That's, that, that could eliminate entire attack vectors. Uh, which Jim Young talked about at AUSA last year. I thought you know, that's very innovative. But the question is, so where does the Army invest given the enormous science and technology research and development that private industry is investing? You know, when you look at the Army's S&T budget and you compare it to just the big tech companies, we have to have better partnership with the big tech companies. That's where they have the money and the resources and working together we can build a much more a secure network. I'll just close with the people. People in this space is everything. There's a panel this afternoon that will address this. Uh, Admiral Rogers uh, laid it out quite well. I believe that the model is going to have to be you educate, train, operate. <coughs> educate, train, operate. And it's, it's constant and it's, uh, you never, your training is never finished. In other words, as opposed to the way we do it now, we send you to a course, you operate for three years, we send you to another course. I see now you operate for a month or two, you have a week or two week course. You operate for a month or two, you have a one week or two week course. We're gonna need that kind. I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Sir, great, thank you. If, uh, with your permission, we'll just go right down the line and keep it easy. And Nate, if I could ask you uh, to provide your comments. One, one little administrative note, you're gonna notice that we, uh, we are not using any slides. This will be a conversation, so we look forward to your questions. I know you're writing them down right now. Nate? 
Thank you. Uh, let me just say at the outset how honored I am to be here. When I showed the lineup to my wife this morning over breakfast, she looked at it and said, huh, three star, two star, one star, no star, that's you. It sounds like a Dr. Seuss book and you're the funny little purple animal. <laughs> so uh, regardless of what comes next, I'm just happy to be here. And my, my task this morning was to, to lay out a few thoughts on vulnerabilities in the future force, resilience in the face of those vulnerabilities, and then talk a little bit about culture and especially the cultural divide between the tech community uh, and the government in this space and, and maybe some thoughts on how we can perhaps bridge it. And I feel like I'm living that divide right now because our, our company has an office here in Washington and an office in San Francisco. And I was there yesterday meeting with our engineers. And in order to have credibility in that crowd, I had to wear my uniform. And my uniform for them is jeans and a t-shirt. And so it's, uh, it's, it's funny to, in, in this course of 24 hours, sort of travel across that divide, and, and I think it actually is, is one of the big issues that, that merits our attention. So on the, on the topic of vulnerabilities, uh, I don't think there's much unique to the Army, and that's generally a good thing. Uh, we live in a world right now of 9 billion connected devices going to 40 billion connected devices by the end of the decade, and think about that. That's a billion devices a quarter that we're connecting. Uh, and, and with that massive device proliferation comes data proliferation, network complexity, uh, a, a massively expanding attack surface, uh, and the challenge of defending it. Uh, another big macro trend that I think is affecting all of us is a convergence between uh, federal problems and threats and commercial problems and threats. The quaint old world of states attacking states and companies spying on companies is dead. Uh, States attack companies and companies attack states, uh, and we all spy on each other. Um, third big trend is a blurring of the lines between offense and defense. And uh, to use a sports analogy, this is soccer, not football. It's not 11, 11 on the field playing O and then 11 on the field playing D. Uh, whether you're on offense or defense really depends on which direction the ball's traveling on the field. So. For 25 years, the military or more, has, the, the military has talked about variations on the theme of total battle space awareness and increasingly making every platform a walking IP address. And I include individual soldiers as platforms here. So every vehicle, every ship, every drone, uh, every aircraft, and, and increasingly every individual soldier and marine uh, is a walking sensor covered with radios, covered with cameras, interactive maps, wearables, embedded technologies. And all of these endpoints are like a, a cavalry doing reconnaissance, and it presents a huge opportunity for data collection and awareness, and obviously significant vulnerability given the connections and our reliance on them. So in, in the face of that uh, uh, increasingly connected force, how should we think about resilience? And my comments will focus on the human side, not on the technical side. Technically, I would just say at the outset that uh, if you're going to respond, you first need to be able to detect, and our detection capabilities aren't nearly what they ought to be, uh, mainly because of that uh, device proliferation and the associated data proliferation and, and network complexity. In many cases, we don't even know what we have, and if we don't know what we have, it's hard to secure it. But on the human side, uh, I'd say it's useful to look at history, and there are three lessons from history uh, with respect to resilience that, that I, would, I would touch on quickly. The first is excellence in the fundamentals. Um, I, I spent five years as an infantry officer, and in my experience, land warfare hasn't changed that much since Thucydides. When the GPS stops working, you better know how to use a map and compass, and when your cyber systems fail, you better know how to use a knife. And so there's just a, a kind of, you know, I think we should anchor ourselves in, in simplicity, maybe. Um, the second point is jointness. Uh, Murphy's Law rules on the battlefield, right? And so we need to ensure one standard, one language, maximum interoperability of systems. And, and think back to Grenada in 1983 and the failures of jointness in that operation that really catalyzed Goldwater Nichols and forced the integration in this joint era. Well, in cyber, we have a greenfield opportunity. So let's build it right from the start. Um, emphasizing openness, ease of use, interoperability, and the ability to scale. The third point on resilience is training exercises. Um, only through real world rapid iteration can we even begin to understand what resiliency looks like because there's no substitute in cyber as in the kinetic world for turning the map around. Uh, we need to understand what we look like from our adversary's perspective. And the only way to do that is, is, uh, is to exercise. 
Um, on culture, I guess this is where I fear maybe being the skunk at the picnic. And um, having been a Marine and now running a venture-backed software company uh, and lived on both sides of the chasm, I am going to start with a basic skepticism um, about the military's ability culturally to recruit and retain great cyber talent. So starting with skepticism then, how can we be constructive and think about ways of bettering the odds? And I think first, uh, we've got to fix acquisition for software products. Uh, and if we don't do that, we're going to take the most innovative private sector solutions off the table. And uh, the whole notion of laying down requirements is, is one that we should think about in this space. Henry Ford famously said that if it were up to, uh, if it were up to uh, uh, his consumers at, at, at that time, they would have asked for a faster horse. And I, I don't think a customer ever would have asked for an iPhone. It, it required uh, a different kind of innovation, a different kind of de development process. Uh, and, and frankly, in the cyber world, this shouldn't be hard because in terms of overall dollars, capital intensiveness, difficulty of development, this is actually a lot easier than uh, many of the platforms we build. Uh, I mean, the, the stuff that we build at Endgame, these aren't F-35s. Uh, you know, they're, they're not aircraft carriers. They're actually a lot simpler. And so um, I think we can decouple the notion that uh, cost and capability are, have to track. Uh, this is a world where you can have immense capability for not a lot of cost. Uh, it's a world where um, you know, we're, we're not trying to go to the moon. We're, we're not doing things necessarily where the government and the private sector ought to share all the risk. I think this is a world where the companies, uh, like in most of our economy, the companies <coughs> ought to bear the majority, if not all, of the financial risk. They ought to bear the majority, if not all, of the technical risk. Um, and, and so, you know, in that sense, this makes it easier for the government. Um, second, on culture, it's a different talent base, right? But motivated by the same intangibles. So. You're not going to recruit them, by and large, off of high school football teams. By and large, it doesn't matter how many pull-ups they can do. Uh, you probably need to consider tailored workplace cultures. You know, zero six formation isn't going to go over very big with this crowd. And uh, they're smart, though, and committed, and motivated by uh, a lot of the same things that everybody else who raises their right hand is, 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 is motivated by. Um, they believe in the country. They believe in their mission. They believe in their comrades. And so there are ways to inspire um, and, and recruit and retain this workforce, but uh, some of the way we think about it and them probably need to change. Third, um, I think we need to force the seniors to get granular. Waving our hands about all this cyber stuff isn't going to work, and so if we think about it in historical terms, uh, the, the, the best example um, I, I can think of is Captain, uh, that's Navy Captain 06, not 03, but Captain Bull Halsey going to flight school uh, and, and learning to fly at a time when naval aviation was going to change. Uh, was going to change the operational landscape um, in the Navy. He saw the writing on the wall and made the, the personal investment. And if you just think about the general notion that it takes any of these 10,000 hours to get good at anything, uh, there's a reason that high school's four years and college is four years and a basic enlistment is four years and uh, you know, a, a president's term of office is four years. You know, it takes 10,000 hours for us to get basically competent <laughs> at anything we do. And so... Uh, uh, I think that, that all of us need to be committed to making that sort of investment of time and energy if we're going to understand the space. Um, final point. Um, General, I completely understood what you were saying uh, when, when uh, it was reported that we need to fail more. And uh, one of my colleagues is, is fond of telling me that there's a difference between failing and being a failure. Uh, and, and actually, if we're going to compete and innovate in the cyber world, we have to fail a lot. Uh, and in our company, we have an award, the, bowl me, the You Bowl Me Over Award. And the actual award is a bowling pin from the air base at Aviano. I don't know how we got it. But it ends up on people's desks, uh, typically the person who failed most spectacularly that week. And uh, I actually want it to be on my desk more. So if, if it's not, then uh, it means we're not trying hard enough. Thank you. George, please. All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. So, uh, just perspective. So I was invited to attend here and, and present when I was still assigned to U.S. Cyber Command as the Commander of National Mission Force. So standard cyber event, invite the cyber, one of the cyber guys. When I found out I was transitioning to take command of INSCOM, U.S. INSCOM, it struck me as an opportunity that I've attended many of these forums, and we never really talk about intelligence at these forums. We assume it, and we, we talk around it, but it's not a topic that we have described here. And so I think what I'm going to try to do is describe some experience from having been in the cyber force for the last couple of years, but why I think there is tremendous, huge potential 
in the intelligence warfighting function, the intelligence business, to do it very differently than we approach it today. And so, you know, part of it is I think people assume that because Cyber Command is co-located with the National Security Agency, because of the highly technical nature of cyber, that intelligence is baked into it, that we just do it as a fabric of what we do, and there could be nothing, you know, less true about that. As a commander of a force, again, it was great being an intel guy, being able to beat up on my two because I was not getting the kind of intelligence I needed to plan and plan to execute. And it's because the systems just aren't in place because we as an army have not taken the the notion of cyberspace as an operating domain, and then applied the warfighting functions to it, in my case, the intelligence warfighting function, to really tailor the sorts of things the intelligence enterprise does to support, again, my main effort in this domain is the Army Service Component Command for Cyber, Second Army, Army Cyber, but writ large across the force. So, again, as a commander, I recognize need for change. Now that I'm in a position as commander of US INSCOM, this was already in a little bit narrower way, one of INSCOM's priorities for the last two years. It was really stated as build out the capabilities of 780th MI Brigade and Army Cyber. And what I've already started a discussion with my staff is about it's bigger than that. It is about changing the way that the Army approaches intelligence, all source intelligence in the cyber domain. Again, we have a main effort, we have some units of employment, but it is much bigger than that initial construct, and that's, that's where we're headed. So I would say as we, you know, as we do mature our thought you know, in this domain, and it, and it talks, Nate hit it and the, and the boss hit it this morning, it's about defining risk. That's what you want part of your intelligence warfighting function, you know, helps define risk to the commander from threats, from the terrain, from the operating environment. That's what we have to provide commanders like General Cardone, Admiral Rogers, the intelligence organization, that function has to provide them knowledge of risk. But as described by Nate and others, that risk has to be designed and defined in a very different way. The threats are different, the, envir the operating environment is complex, and it's just, we're just not quite there yet. Um, Brian mentioned, again, I would not recommend you read the monograph because it's pretty dated and, it, and I did pass the course, but, but uh, what I would commend to you is the lesson I did learn in SAMS and the reason I think the monograph to me was useful at the time is it's, a, it's about applying doctrine. Again, at that time it was combat, how you define combat power and how you approach an operational problem using doctrine, but then how you tailor, deviate, take the doctrine but apply it to a complex environment so you're not dogmatic or pedantic, you take a framework that everybody you're working with understands and then you modify it to fit the operating environment. So I would tell you there is, at the start, there's some seed corn out there of doctrine that will allow us to approach, again, not solve the problem, but approach this move to 2025 in the intelligence war fighting function. And that, anybody who's heard me talk at one of these, I commend you to Joint Pub 3 TAC 12. It's a thin book, it's classic, but it's the start. It's the first useful piece of doctrine that describes the functions in the cyber domain that we can apply across the joint force. And that's the, that's the step to move forward from. Again, we don't need everybody to reinvent. It really puts into perspective a lot of things that, that Nate talked about that I'm sure the boss talked about this morning. So start with Joint Pub 3 TAC 12 and move on. One of the concepts in there that I find uh, incredibly useful, and I think this, will, this is going to be part of the anchor of what INSCOM will, will approach with, is it does define intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance operations in the cyber domain, ISR. The intel community understands ISR. Most commanders now understand as ISR, but it's how you take that, uh, that doctrine, that notion of ISR as an all-source, multi-event, and now you execute it in the cyber domain for the purpose of achieving cyber effects. To enable a cyber commander, that's, that's task one, and then how you also use that operations through the domain to enable, in our case, unified land operations. That is two very discrete mission sets that have to blend and be synergistic, but it is two very different sets of missions from my personal experience. And, and why that is so different, and I think the the biggest area of work initially is our support to defense and cyberspace operations. It's been great focus on support to offensive cyber, and that's where a majority of the intelligence work has gone is to support planning and understanding to support things like on more on the OCO side. We have such huge opportunity on the cyber defensive portfolio and the intelligence support to cyber defense. In, in the opportunity arises, I think, in one, redefining what we mean by, mean by all source intelligence information in the cyber domain. And I'll give you the analogy that General Cardin mentioned, you know, the Cyber Op 4 going out to the CTC and crushing that unit that's trying to operate their network. So they have, a, they have some key terrain they're trying to defend, and they're being attacked by a well-trained Op 4 that is intent on entering the network and doing some damage. And yet, that network, all of the sensors on that network, none of those are feeding the two's understanding of the threat. None of the work going on to, to understand the threat, that, there's all kinds of indications and warnings coming through the sensors in that network, but it's not going into the intel 
you know, databases that the two can look at it. It's going into some stovepipe information assurance database where it sits because it wasn't designed to be part of an all-source intelligence picture to help defend that network. And that, that's at the lowest level all the way up to the highest level. There's, there's huge amounts of information that, that has not heretofore been thought of as potential intelligence that could feed an all-source multi-end picture. And so it gets back to technology and innovation and how we bring that to bear, you know, in the fight. The other thing I think, again, that we'll look at from an intelligence uh, INSCOM perspective is how you bring all disciplines, all of the disciplines that apply in the, in the <coughs> intel domain, in the war fighting function, UMIT, SIGINT, multi-IMP, and again, you have to tailor that to operate in the domain to support operations in the domain. Those are different decisions. It's different environment. You know, the terrain that we look at in the cyber domain, it's the physical, logical, and persona. But to understand the terrain, particularly the physical and logical, that's going to take a much tighter lash up between those folks who operate the networks, the blue terrain, and those who are trying to understand them through the intelligence war fighting function linked to those who defend it. And I can tell you just by very limited experience, as we prepare to deploy the first of the cyber protection teams that used to work for me, you know, one of the first missions of that team is to go in and help the friendly unit map their net, understand the network because inevitably the supported unit, defended unit, doesn't understand its own terrain. And that, again, is bringing, applying a war, intel warfighting function mentality to understanding the operational environment, understanding the threat, doing IPB, intelligence preparation of the battle space, in the cyber domain tailored to a commander like General Cardone who has different, he's got different decisions, he's got to make different risk, a different calculus that we have to bring to that. And so what I'll end with is, again, we, we, we have enough, you know, baseline <coughs> doctrine in place to guide the discussion, not to shape it, not to limit it, but to start to tie people like, like Nate who is thinking about it, you know, we can start to tie innovative thought back to a concept that we can apply somewhat normally across a fairly large force. And we can use that to integrate the discussion of cyberspace operations with the other domains that we have to operate with. And so you have to have a basic foundation. From my perspective, the intel warfighting function and how those things are defined is a useful start. And so I've already you know, promised to General Carter, and the reason, again, so the reason I'm glad to be here partnered with Army Cyber is INSCOM and Army Cyber are tied at the hip in this fight. But it's, it's bigger than that. It's, it's got to apply to all of the intel community, all of those folks who participate, and then expanding our, our you know, relationships with people at DISA and the G6, those folks who actually understand, operate the terrain that we have to understand, and really expand on those relationships across the board to do what is my task, which is to provide the Army with, you know, with dominant intel support. And that, again, different perspective, but I'm glad to be here to answer any questions on that. George, thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Garrett, over to you, please. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a program manager at DARPA. Uh, DARPA has one primary uh, mission, uh, actually two primary missions, but the, the first and the original one was to prevent uh, technological surprise to the nation. It started in response to Sputnik. So I think that cyber is an excellent example of something that is uh, poised to be, if it is not actually already, a technological surprise to the country with uh, wide-ranging uh, ramifications. So let me back way, way, way back up and think about domains of warfare. So uh, I would say the oldest domain of warfare is land. That's, uh, that's why we have an army. You guys are expert at fighting on the land. I would suppose that the second historical um, domain of warfare is the sea. So the sea has uh, different characteristics than the land, obviously. Um, and that's why we have a Navy. I would say the third domain of warfare is the air. So that started about 100 years ago. It is yet different from the land and the sea, and we have an Air Force. Um, so I'm going to propose that perhaps the fourth domain is cyber. So it has different characteristics uh, than any of the other, than land, sea, or air. It's the first one of the domains that is not a physical domain. People don't physically live there. You can't travel there physically. Um, it's much more abstract. You don't have physical intuition uh, in cyber uh, as you would have, uh, well, certainly on the land and for some people on sea or air. Um, the, um, some of the other characteristics that have already been brought up is um, you can enter this domain with much lower capital uh, costs than you can in the others. If you want to create an entire army and you want to have tanks, I don't, I don't know how much uh, M1A1 cost, but more than I can afford at home. It's not something I can build in my garage. So you, you have to be a major state actor to uh, participate there. Similarly, um, at sea, uh, you know, I don't have an aircraft carrier at home. So, um, so I can't participate there. 
Uh, air, I, I do have a small airplane. It wouldn't fare well against an F-16. So um, I think I really can't compete uh, very well against air. And frankly, if we looked worldwide right now, we would see a uh, few pure competitors in, in really any one of those spaces. Um, so if somebody you know, wants to take on the army in a you know, sort of one-on-one -on -one battle, that, that, that doesn't go well for them. Um, my uh, Air Force pr friends asked them, when was the last major air battle? Vietnam? <coughs> Something like that? So we don't have a lot of pure competitors there. When was the last cyber attack, major cyber attack? What, what time is it now? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> right? Currently. So, so this is going on all the time, and one of the reasons is it's just a easy, it's low barrier of entry. You, you guys know all of that. So um, I'm going to purport that um, we tend to think, uh, I believe, of cyber in a much narrower way than we ought to. Um, so we tend to think of it in terms of network defense, certainly, and certainly <laughs> that's an important part. Uh, we like to think about offensive cyber, although I would say the way we think about a, offensive cyber is attacking you know, a, a, a foreign army's network, maybe the state, um, but um, even we, we don't do much offensive uh, cyber operations. Um, and when we do, they tend to be very narrowly focused. I'm gonna come back around to that. And then, um, at least to my ears, uh, it's relatively new to think about uh, cyber as an adjunct to um, the other ints. To me, that makes perfect sense. So all these things, they're sensible, uh, but I would say that there's a lot, lot more, um, and we're just at the very <laughs> beginning of, of starting to understand those things. Um, so just like each one of the other domains actually ultimately led to a new armed service, uh, that that's what they did. Um, I think um, I've known General Alexander for a long time. I think that was very forward thinking of him to realize that there needs to be a new command, a new organization that's responsible for cyber, and, and, and hence we have uh, that whole organization. Um, but I think that we're probably at the same state uh, of cyber as maybe we were in aviation in, I don't know, 1908 or 9, 10, something like that. We've, uh, we've kind of figured out, oh, airplanes, they can fly, that's good. You can look down on people, okay. Maybe you could drop little things, rocks, maybe a grenade or something on them. You could shoot other airplanes. Turned out there was a lot more you could do. Um, and so I think that we're just at the very, very beginning of that, <clears throat> and that um, the constraints are largely our imagination. Um, the thing that really troubles me is that uh, it appears to me that many of our enemies uh, are not, at, their imaginations are not as restrained as ours. Um, so um, I personally feel that we're under <clears throat> um, numerous heavy attacks right now that we, that some people realize uh, and the public realizes a little bit, uh, but they're just sort of barely beginning to learn about. So let me uh, conclude with uh, three things that uh, keep me awake at night. <clears throat> so the first one is um, organizational boundaries. Um, I think, um, well, this is just sort of a general problem for any uh, large you know, bureaucratic thing like the US government. Uh, when uh, we're dealing with other adversaries that are also large uh, bureaucratic enterprises, then you know at least we're equal, maybe we're even a little better. Uh, when we're dealing with smaller, more agile um, you know, enterprises, organizations, frankly, they have the advantage. Um, and a thing I've learned as an amateur student of military tactics is find the seams and exploit them. Wow, boy, do we have some big, big seams. And it seems like uh, people have figured out that exploiting them and crossing those boundaries is a very smart idea. Um, sort of to press that point just a little bit more, um, <clears throat> I already mentioned uh, the, the almost unimaginable strength we have in traditional military warfare. Um, if I were an advisor for the bad guys, and if there are any CI people in the room, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not an agent of a foreign power. Um, but just thinking imaginarily, if I would, if I were, there's no way I would advise anyone to go up against the U.S. military on a, you know, a head-to-head -head combat. That, that's just suicide, and we've demonstrated that over the last few decades. That's a horribly bad idea. 
Um, so think of something else. Think, think of something a, little, a lot more subtle, um, but could be just as effective, and part of that would be crossing the boundaries. <clears throat> the second thing is uh, embedded systems, and uh, General Cardone mentioned these, and um, uh, I think actually uh, Mr. Fick did as well. So um, we do not think about the computers that are all around us, at, at least very few people do. So uh, in your car, um, depends on what kind of car you have, um, I have a pretty old, simple one, uh, but it still probably has a dozen microprocessors in it. If you have something fancy, uh, it could have 30 or 40 different microprocessors in them. Uh, they have approximately zero security. Um, there have already been studies, uh, some of them uh, popularized by DARPA. Um, if you have a sort of a smart, well, by smart car, I mean you have an information system um, that, uh, or an, in, I'm sorry, an entertainment system um, <clears throat> that, you know, a little dashboard with a moving map that you can see things about your car on it, I can take over your car. So I can take over uh, your brakes, your uh, accelerate, your acceleration, I can lock the door, I can track you. If you have one of the self-steering cars, yeah, I can do the steering too. Um, and um, I can do that with a Bluetooth device, I can do that <coughs> through OnStar. Uh, do you ever listen to CDs uh, in your uh, system? Well, you can put software on those CDs that can take over your car. So those are, you, you can look those up on the internet. Um, so those are automobiles. Um, what about helicopters or I mentioned tanks or Bradleys? Um, wow, they have a lot of embedded uh, software in them. Has anybody thought about the uh, security on them? The people who designed them? I'd be skeptical um, because I bet they're really, really smart about artillery, uh, armor, sensors. I bet they know a huge amount about those things. Computer software, probably not so much. And no one was thinking that, oh, who, who could possibly take over my tank? I'm sitting in it. It's isolated. It's, I don't have a network connection to it. Oh, really? You don't have a network connection to it. How do you do the logistics on it? How do you get, do you get updates? Uh, do you get uh, information sent to the tank? I believe you do. So there's an attack vector there to think about. So um, uh, just one last thing to mention um, on the embedded devices. Um, so uh, IP cameras, uh, one of the things that uh, I've heard has been in the news lately is baby monitors. Um, so you may think, well, we didn't really have any baby monitors at INSCOM. Um, but um, last time I was there, I saw some BTCs, uh, and some of them are on Cipher and JWix, which one could argue uh, is more secure. Um, but what about the things that are on Nipper? Um, do, do you have a microphone on your computer or a camera on your computer? And is it, is it physically disabled? Um, how about people are, that are walking in with smartphones? And yeah, you collect most of those at the door, but. Um, anyway, uh, something to consider. <laughs> the last thing, and then I'll uh, be quiet, is um, unanticipated and attack vectors. So I've, I've kind of warmed, hopefully warmed you up to this, about uh, thinking about, wow, so where are all these devices, and how could I go about using them in ways you didn't anticipate? Uh, Jeff uh, may talk about uh, this uh, some when uh, it's his turn. So um, we tend to think about really kind of big frontal attacks on the network that you'll notice. Um, what if I did something a lot more subtle? So I, I'm a believer um, really in not crashing a system or destroying it. Well, why would I want to do that? Um, why don't I go in the logistics system and just mess with it a little bit? Or uh, go into the personnel system and just mess with that a little bit? Um, I bet I could have a lot of fun with your operations if I did that. And if I uh, do it in a subtle fashion, how long will it be before you notice uh, that I was doing that? So, uh, like I said, uh, these are things that I, that I kind of worry about. Um, I'm a, I've always been a citizen of the US. I'd like to continue to live here. <laughs> so it concerns me about our, our future welfare. The very last thing that, I'll, that I'm going to say is um, I took away a homework problem also uh, from General Cardone's re remark, which was um, the ability to compute risk. Um, so that's uh, in the cyber domain. Uh, that's something that I've thought about. I haven't made a lot of progress on. Um, 
But uh, what I see is we have lots of anecdotes. We have many, many stories about cyber attacks. That's good. We have a few, not many, what I would call case studies. Um, so better than anecdotes, um, but not really a wide-ranging assessment. Um, so the reason I haven't done it is I don't really know how to do it, but um, I think uh, it ought to be possible really to compute risk. Um, so how is it that we could determine in a, you know, a rational, logical, with some mathematics involved, um, a way to uh, compute, well, what are the risk vectors here? So uh, what are our vulnerabilities and, and what's the operational or the financial uh, impact to those? So thank you very much for your attention. Randy, thanks very much. On, on the baby monitor note, interesting antidote there. My uh, uh, daughter-in-law, uh, who's out in El Paso, uh, uses the baby monitor for our two-year-old granddaughter. And about three weeks ago, uh, I don't know if this is the right term, but someone actually hacked into that monitor. Mm -hmm. and they, uh, it, was a, it was a man's voice, and they woke, the, they woke our granddaughter up. So. Wow. Yes, scary. And I, I hope uh, George does not have baby monitors over <laughs> uh, headquarters. Thanks for those uh, uh, comments, Gary. Uh, General Torello, if we could, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm writing a note, next car is a 50 Chevy, so I'm <laughs> 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 uh, No, and I, I, I appreciate uh, uh, Dr. Garrett's comments. I think they kind of fit in with what I think I'm supposed to be doing up here since my cyber knowledge is Microsoft Outlook and not much more than that. Uh, but I think what is important is the RSOF perspective. I think that ties in with a lot of things that uh, we've discussed here. And, and we don't, uh, offense, defense, we get that, but, but, but our thinking and a lot of our, our uh, brain power is being applied to cyber enabled, some of these things discussed here. I mean, Arab Spring, social media, I, I think that opened our eyes. You know, when I started out, I had an Apple IIc. I mean, you had to take the, the disk out, the operating disk, and put in the memory disk, and, and a computer was, uh, you know, high-speed typewriter and a, and a calculator. And then, and then we got the internet, and, and I could send emails, and it was a means of communication. Uh, I think what really woke me up is, is uh, the Arab Spring and social media. I, you know, I, I'm not in that generation. I've kind of avoided it for a lot of the reasons uh, we talk about here and that soft guys don't wear name tags and such thing. Uh, but there's a whole generation that's brought up in that. So I think uh, that's an important aspect of us. But really, I think the foundation, and, and as a command, Army Special Operations Command, who I'm representing, Lieutenant General Charles Cleveland here, uh, is 25 years old. We're not that old ourselves. So our first doctrine was published uh, 2012, not that long ago. Uh, we, we've taken the lessons of 9-11, but more importantly, look back to what we are supposed to be about and defined ourselves, and that's important because we haven't done a very good job of that lately. But a lot of the underlying uh, thought process or, or aspects of what we look at is the human domain. Uh, domain. And I know that's not a uh, well accepted concept or, or there's some, some, you know, disagreement with that. But I think the human factors, I mean, getting back to it, it's, it's the clash of wills. And that's what we focus on. So our special operations core principles are discrete, precise, and scalable operations to give RSOF the ability to operate in small teams <coughs> in friendly, politically sensitive, uncertain, or hostile environments to achieve U.S. objectives unilaterally or with or through indigenous forces and populations. That puts a whole new, I think, strain on this discussion at least, or at least for us, it has an obligation that we've got to nest with the ongoing efforts and to truly understand where we fit in that and to kind of, again, bring this perspective into the larger debate. And again, from our, from our documents, what I've tried to do is kind of pull out some major themes in here. It, it does require well-educated and trained soldiers with appropriate technical capabilities and control measures that allow them to operate untethered to create meaningful, meaningful effects. I, I would also emphasize that 
this is not phase three combat operations. I mean, you know, we are doing this now. Cyber is going on now. Conflict is happening now. So however you define it, you know, preferably on a soft thinking, the human train, we would like to get on a front end. Uh, we understand we cannot do this alone. We must be integrated with the Army and our other services, technology, planning, and lexicon to bring the required capabilities to bear in support of the uh, JTF commander across the spectrum of conflict. For us, another emphasis is that we also work with interagency partners. I think if you look at the human domain, it, it, it gives you a natural flow from the military aspect to Department of State, until intelligence activities, NGOs, and it, and it provides a thread of why is that relevant on the battlefield. And we have to work with them as well. There's a whole new, all, all this discussion we've just kind of applied to the military now wraps us into a larger picture, I think, of how we work with them, how we integrate. Uh, in documenting special operations, I think what these, what these uh, manuals are trying to say and our doctrine is trying to say is we seek the effective integration of effects across the physical, social, and cogn cognitive levels of conflict and search for a framework for military planning and execution to maximize effectiveness in an increasingly uncertain, hostile, and adaptive world fueled by increasingly influential, rapid-paced information in cyber domain operations. I think one of the, the other major factors that these, uh, our publications and our recent efforts are trying to do, and cyber is mentioned uh, very specifically uh, in the training that we have to formalize uh, our training with, with uh, SOCOM, Army Cyber, U.S. Cyber. Uh, but I think, too, we, our, our operations, <coughs> soft operations, Columbia, those kind of things are long-term. Does operational planning, the SAMS courses, those kind of things give you, or just, just what a normal J-5 uh, looks at, give you the proper perspective to go into these things? And, and we think there's another aspect of it. Uh, for us, we are looking at soft operational design, which is, yes, it's the MDMP in this, but it's also trying to take the effects of long-term operations and that you have to go back, that, that, you know, people adapt, the threat adapts, the environment changes, and you have to go back and constantly plan. And how do you lay that out in the beginning so that you're ready with your options on, on how you deal with things? Uh, other than that, I'm just happy to be here. Uh, it's, it's an honor, and I think I will get more out of the conversation than I will give, but for what it's worth, I think that's a short summary of the soft perspective. Mike, great points. Like, uh, like you, I know that the N in Ranger stands for knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeff, if we could close out with you, uh, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm going to just touch a little bit on the, the, the term that was introduced with my uh, title, the cyber economic risk, um, and, and my firm as well, EY. Uh, it's sometimes very difficult to, to speak publicly about some of the things that we do because when you're in, in within a large, uh, what they call big four, um, it's a risk management firm, but that also means that they're somewhat risk adverse. Uh, so discussing specifics about something that is cyber and economic, it is very sensitive because uh, sometimes people tend to hear what we're saying and they apply it to different decisions they're making on a business and, and that can get risky for the firm. So we always have to think about how we're going to have a discussion like this in a public forum. So uh, forgive me if I don't speak specifically uh, about certain facts. And I think I'm going to adopt Dr. Garrett's approach and I'll, I'll apply a lot of what ifs and then you can kind of try to read between the lines. Okay. Um, two years ago we began a, uh, a new research effort. Um, there was a number of us that had kind of grown up in the community through the 80s and the 90s, information warfare and, and um, different information security companies. And we all kind of became frustrated in the early 2000s because our community seemed to be rushing towards this thing called maturity, okay, and, and, and defining what maturity was well before what we believe the community should be mature, okay, because if you really haven't solved it, why are you rushing to be mature? Because if you lock this down and you call it mature, you start training all of your individuals to do what doesn't work, 
you're training them to do 50% or 30% or 70% of the solution, which means it still doesn't work. And then the books are written, the movies are made, and people continue to do the same thing over and over. And in our community, that can be very dangerous because it affects business, the economy, and national security. Um, tying together with one of the other comments that Dr. Garrett made, he said, you know, you have land air for you, <coughs> land warfare, you have sea warfare, air warfare. Well, those are all somewhat components of a larger war, right? It's, it's economic and political. That's the goal, the real goals and objectives. So the term that we use, cyber economic risk, is our attempt to start, try to shift the focus away from the IT, which is a component, and place the emphasis on the objective, okay? And the objective is economic risk, and then they fight it at different levels, right? There's different things that go on. And I'm talking about material impacts. I'm not talking about the normal hacker that might come in to take your credit card. I'm talking about the bigger threats that we're all aware of. So if you change your focus and you shift it to the economic and political level, things start to make a little bit more sense. That was our theory, okay? So two years ago when new guidance came out to start reporting material incidents differently for commercial organizations, they redefined it and they actually got to the right definition. It started talking about when you do an investigation, you need to be able to report on whether or not there was a material impact in these areas. And they listed sales, future sales, past sales, market share, past, present. Okay? So who better, and this is one of the reasons that I, I came to UI as well, uh, who better to really dig into that and research it and see whether or not if you took a different set of optics and you place it on the objectives or these business risk scenarios for each industry, and you took this different data, you took the cyber data, put it in one bucket, you took the targeting data, put it in another bucket, what they were going after, what was going out, and then you started taking other data, because in business, in economics, it's actually kind of binary, right? It's, you know, it, where there's a debit, there's a credit somewhere. Where somebody takes in R&D, somebody else picks up R&D. Ask Ford, right? Just last month, they, you saw that brand new Ford 150 released in China, but Ford didn't release it, okay? So when you see R&D go out of the door, it's not just because they want R&D, it's because somebody's converting it, right? So our focus shifted. So then you start applying more and more financial data, uh, accounting types of data, economic data, okay, uh, M&A data, sales data, all of the different types of data that are tied to economics and business, tie it in and you started to see different things that we really weren't expecting, okay? which then resulted in the creation of the cyber economic risk area. So when we got into that and we started doing case studies and started doing our investigations using these new techniques, we started going in and doing investigations, and instead of focusing <coughs> on the, the NIST type of approach or ISO, we would use that as the technical piece, but we had another team then that, that would be the, the business people, economic minds, financial minds, fraud, antitrust, market manipulation, all of the different types of analytics that you would apply to that kind of data to see, is there something else here? And then run it back 10 years. Every time you're doing an investigation, run it back 10 years because if it is nation state, if it is truly material, you should see different things over a 10 year cycle. Because remember, business doesn't happen overnight, right? Industries don't shift. Industries are not lost normally over light night, okay? They normally take time. R&D is not converted overnight. When somebody steals R&D, it still has a life cycle of how long it takes to convert it. So you have to understand every industry and every life cycle for R&D and the metrics. You start applying that, and then you start seeing different things, okay? So it gets to the what ifs. <coughs> you know, what if you went to a petrochem kind of company and you did an investigation, and what if it normally would have ended with a couple of servers and you normally would write a report and say here's the controls that were violated and here's what you might do going forward for your business risk, but you don't really write about the business. You say business risk, but you're really saying fix the computer, okay? Instead, you use the business minds at the table and you, brought, you created a business risk scenario for a nation state actor. What would they be after and why? Okay, and then an organized crime player. What would they be after and why? And what if they were working together? Okay, now that helps you focus, right? It helps you look at the data differently. And then when you go through the investigation using that <coughs> technique, you actually identify that cells was literally manipulated, you know, over some period of time. Again, what if? Um, six to nine months, and that company missed its numbers and it lost value, a percentage of its value and percentage of its market share because somebody else picked up those cells. Okay. 
what if the R&D that was stolen was the true secrets for your future? It was tied to the, let's say, green products or something like that, something very special for your future. Okay, and then somebody else converted it, right? You were able to point to somebody that converted it. And then what if your supply chain system had been interrupted, but in a, almost an ingenious business way, not a denial of service, as Dr. Garrett said, a subtle way. What if changes were made so that every month you only received 97% of the raw materials required to produce the goods that month? Okay, if you can't produce enough goods for what you have sold, you probably don't hit your revenue number. You probably don't hit your profit number. You're missing. So now you're going down again. You're missing sales and you're missing revenue. And your R&D and your return on R&D isn't going to be met because what you thought might be a 10-year advantage is actually already gone. Okay. Then if you took that data and you were able to look at the entire industry and you looked at it and you said, wait a minute, it's almost like every company for the last 10 years has a role in this. Some are intended to be the innovators in the industry, provide that innovation over to somebody else, and, and then the market's being lost to those two or three over there, but these are still being allowed to survive because they still have to be your supply of innovation. So you don't want them to go away. But then there's others that are losing a lot of money. Where's that money going? How might that money be used? And it almost looks like the money is helping to fund the corporate espionage in that industry. I mean, what if, what if it was that bad? What if financial theft was not separated from R&D theft? What if it was part of a larger plan? So you start seeing this different, these different corollaries, okay? And then you start looking at the deception, as uh, Dr. Garrett mentioned. And you start seeing that, wow, well, every four months they're taking the R&D, okay? And then two to three days later, there's this loud, noisy attack from another country, okay? And that company's policy is when you get a loud, noisy attack from a country, it looks that loud, noisy, it appears to be non-sophisticated, uh, rebuild the server. That basically erases all the evidence from the stealth attack, right? So all of the evidence, all of the stuff that you would typically collect to point back at the bad guy that took the R&D is now gone. And what if something like that happened over two to three year periods just based on the evidence that you had? And a lot of very interesting data comes out of it. Then when you look at all of the other industries, what happens if you see that that's happening in every industry to some extent, and there's literally a playbook, you can actually almost predict where an industry is today, and then the types of things that are going to happen in the next stage, in the next stage, okay? Because again, business people actually do follow a strategic roadmap, and each industry does have a certain amount of value up front. If you're missing assets, it's always important to create Industries around <coughs> infrastructure first, for example, energy first, because everybody needs that. Before you go into high tech, you probably need roads and buildings, phones, ports. And then what if that, that research further, we said, you know what, keep pulling the string, see if there's anything international that connects with those things. There's, is there something happening in the emerging nation of, nations of Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia? And then you saw some direct correlations where those same techniques were being used to secure monopolies in those future markets for the Western world. They were literally being locked down so that your companies couldn't expand, which means their value would eventually decrease and even the tax revenue required to run our military goes down, okay? And then what if you looked at the ports and maritime and you saw the correlation with a, a growing level of influence and ownership in almost every major world port an oil port and maritime so that if our military needed that, it wasn't there when they needed it, okay? And you actually were able to track all this, okay? And then what if you then take a look at the organized crime in the world because you have access to that kind of data too and you saw that there is coordination between the two from time to time where one is being used to help carry out a certain function and then being paid off in other types of uh, monetary value, okay? So if you saw that, that might be concerning to you, okay? So that's why we created this new group. That's why you really haven't heard much about this type, because again, we're, we're continuing to scrub how we, we talk in public. But it raided, raised a lot of questions internally for a firm like ours, because we have to, by law, help our companies identify financial economic risk. 
So now instead of going in after these investigations and saying, hey, look, it was, it was IT, it was your outlook, your email, or whatever, you now find yourself in front of boards because you're talking about their business, you're talking about their industry, and they've now realized that they lost 10% of the market over the last four years, and it was attributed directly to these types of activities. Now you gotta put in plans that are more strategic in nature because you see that these things take five to 10 years and you can help them plot that out. So again, now they're thinking about the objective. If they know the objective and they communicate more with the government, they're starting to realize that too. They can't fight a company on company battle when the other company is actually a government, okay? So they're realizing that. And, that. and then it shapes the way they use their sensors, the way they introduce other technologies like honeypots and beacons, things that most people don't use today. Uh, and now they can create more of a proactive threat intelligence driven program around those business risk scenarios. So that's some of the changes that we're seeing and that's some of the, the things that we wanted to share with you today. And you can understand too how much that impacts the difference in the way that they're, we're helping them train their staffs. Okay, so it's no longer just training an IT guy. It's bringing all those disciplines into a room and training them as a group on what the objectives are and then how they fit in to those bigger campaigns. So that's it. Yeah. Oh, by the way, yeah. I'm Navy, so it's, it's ARG. ARG. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, thanks. Uh, great points, and great points from all the panel members. Uh, we, have a, we have a good 50 minutes for questions, and so uh, I'm going to instruct uh, General Torello to stand at the back and do a rear strangle takedown if anyone tries to leave before 1230. <laughs> and beyond that, AUSA is serving MREs or meals <coughs> rejected by Ethiopians for lunch today, so there's no rush to get to lunch. And so uh, if you've got some more cards, please provide those to uh, Mike and we'll, we'll keep on going here. Uh, the, the first question is for uh, General Cardone, and uh, it simply states, uh, is current doctrine, and you may want to, sir, expand this out to uh, the whole dot mill process, is current doctrine sufficient for cyber operations, and if not, what changes are required? And this uh, would be a great question, I think, for this afternoon's panel as well with uh, General Patterson, uh, General Brown, and, and Colonel Buckner uh, as well. Sir? So as uh, George said, uh, Joint Pub 312, I think, is a really great start. Uh, but doctrine evolves over time, and we have to capture lessons. And just e even hearing the panel this morning makes me start thinking about some of the things we have in the current doctrine. For the Army, the Army's got two uh, pieces of doctrine it's working on. It's working on its own FM 312, which will be uh, nested with JP 312, and it's also working from the bottom, the tactical part, FM 338. And so we have a lot of thinking to do in this space still because, you know, you get these, uh, we, we often hear about this Intel Ops. Does Intel drive operations? Does Ops drive Intel? I answered, my answer to that question is yes. But you have the same thing in cyber, because you have cyber and electronic warfare, and electronic warfare and cyber. Cyber and information operations, information operations, cyber. Cyber and fires, fires and cyber. You know, so when you, you can go down each warfighting function, you can go down these and you can see, you can use cyber to go one direction, cyber the other. I take the point up here, I. I, uh, about the lack of imagination, that's really my challenge to most operational commanders. We lack imagination in this space. Doctrine can help frame our thinking. Our challenge is to make sure it's broad enough that it captures the disruptions that are in the space so that we don't unnecessarily constrain our thinking. You know, I think, Jeff, your comments down there in the end with we don't approach things from an economic view and then you could immediately take that application back into the national security arena and down. And, and we don't look at it that way. And so I'm asked, I, as you were talking, I'm thinking, are we, have we unduly constrained ourselves by the way that we framed it? And so I think the answer is we have a good document that we work on now. I think we have to constantly update it. Those of you that have heard me before, I think everything in cyber should be relooked every three years. It's structure, it's doctrine, it's organization, and it's technology. And if we do not do that, we run great risk in being invested in the wrong areas. Thank you, sir. George uh, or uh, Mike, would you uh, care to comment on that? Yeah, so I, I would absolutely agree, General Carr. You know, what doctrine is there is, even 312, as good as it is, is already day. I mean, it's, it's about a year old, and it's already 
in many places, it's not kept up with reality how we're operating. So I, and it's not very deep. So there's some very baseline document, but across the warfighting functions, not deep. Again, I think in part because we're still developing the concepts, but I also, again, my sense is that, <coughs> that, that we're, we're waiting for maturity. Somebody mentioned maturity. You know, we're waiting for things to get more mature. We can't wait. We've got to get doctrine to the extent we can on the show, out in the hands of operators so that we can change it and turn it on a much quicker cycle than, and I, I know we're moving in that direction, but I, it's just, it kind of right now lacks depth. So we have some basic constructs we'll start to fill in, but but it's got to be innovative, and, and really, we got to get the construct out in the hands of the teams, and then let that be fed from the bottom up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, probably later on this afternoon, the Cyber Center of Excellence, General Patterson, and many others uh, will want to talk about that a little bit as well. Mike, care to comment you, on that? You're just picking on me because it took us 20 years to write doctrine, aren't you? Now, <laughs> <laughs> no. And I think, look, just because we didn't have doctrine didn't mean things weren't going on. And I think for us in particular, it is it is a bottom up process. I mean. I am a support mechanism for an ODA and a CA team and a PSYOP team. They're, they're doing that stuff now. And we are moving out with, uh, those teams are moving out uh, at CTCs and those kind of things. We're doing some innovative things in, in closed circuits, just trying to replicate some of the stuff. But I, 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 think it is, I think it is a mix of really just dipping your toe in the water and, and pulling out what you, what you have at that point and, and then kind of dipping back in almost. I mean, that's kind of the soft way. It's, it's the teams develop it. It kind of comes up. We capture it, uh, you know, TTPs, those kind of things, and, and then you understand what you have to solidify. I, I, I don't know if that's the right answer for obviously, uh, you know, cyber domain, but I think it's, I think it's a piece of it. You really got to get that, that feel from, from what uh, the folks are doing out in the field. There's certainly different ways to look at the problem. I mean, the early in battle may be a classic example. We certainly had Apaches and Paladins and M1 tanks and concepts that drove the, doc the doctrine, but the technology that enabled that kind of doctrine, which came first, uh, not really sure. So in cyber, I think we have very similar comparisons. And, and, and there is a seventh warfighting function now, uh, engagement. Uh, it was started by mm -hmm. a special operations center. We, we would have preferred influence. It was kind of this piece of partnering nations, you know, this human terrain domain piece that, that we've kind of added to it. So I think it kind of adds to the conversation again in, in our little space over here about some of the other kind of cyber operations. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, next question uh, is for uh, General Franz and uh, Dr. Garrett. How can the Army leverage innovative ideas and experimentation from industry better to inform and accelerate Army cyber efforts? I'll, I'll give a very short. I'll give a very Go short answer, and then I'm on a hand. Yes. So I, I, and, and I'll try to give an answer that doesn't get me in trouble with army staff. I, so I think one way that I am sure of having again been in command all of two weeks, a way that we are again kind of programmatically trying to do that is as we design the next versions of the Army Distributed Common Ground Station, our analytic framework and architectural framework. It's it's going to open, you know, open framework. Again, getting away from proprietary, very you know, niche built things to open that up so we can then bring in the innovation. And that's been, I will tell you, the analysts, so the soldiers there, every, every intel analyst, you know, since I came in the Army has been hammering away at, we want better tools, we want quicker tools, why can't I have the thing I can do on my, you know, my handheld device now? So it's, it's bringing that innovation in by opening up the frame, opening up, changing the methodology by which we obtain that capability. So we're, I know we're, we're going to move in that direction. I, and my sense is, you know, we're applying that currently to the, the analytic platform, that same framework can be applied to most of the cyber tool sensors, those other things that, that are involved in the cyber domain. There's lots of great opportunity to bring that in in a framework. I think your cyber or your DSIG uh, analogy is a great one. There's 12 or 13 companies involved. There's an innovative cyber or uh, DSIG's lab. IRADs and CRADAs are, are created to help uh, the I2WD team. Another good question for Mr. Mueller when he's here later on today. So I think you're spot on, George. Thanks. Dr. Garrett, any, any comments on that? Um, I have a lot of comments. I don't have any answers. Um, so my comment is um, I have worked for the defense industry most of my lifetime so far uh, and hope to continue to do so for a while yet. Um, as soon as I got out of college, uh, I was working for a huge defense contractor, and they were talking about acquisition reform. That was quite a few decades ago, and, and we're still talking about acquisition reform. Maybe we've done reform you know, in those decades, I, it's hard for me to, to see the difference. Uh, so uh, just 
from my point of view, uh, one of our big problems is the way that we've incentivized the system. So um, we have incentivized everyone to be super low risk. Um, so if you're a program manager for Army Materiel Command, you have a set of objectives to meet, key performance parameters that some of them are well-defined, some of them less well-defined. You've got a schedule to meet, you've got a budget. Um, there's uh, very little room for flexibility in there. And as a person who, who builds things, uh, both for work and, and for fun, I have found that really I never get things right when I first start out. Um, I thought I knew how to do something. As soon as I start, I find out um, that didn't actually work. Um, and what I observe um, in the Army Material Command and, and really all the others is uh, that doesn't stop us. So we figure out that uh, normally the engineers, frequently the operators realize, well, that's not really working, but doesn't matter. We've got that in our plan. We brief Congress and we're going to plow ahead uh, regardless. And, and we do so. Now the trouble is, is that physics doesn't listen. So, <laughs> you know, we had this plan, but the rest of the world, you know, the, the actual world isn't listening. Um, in fact, uh, it's, it's doing sort of the opposite. And so uh, five years later, 10 years later, we wind up with a system that really kind of most people knew wasn't going to work. Uh, but, you know, a billion dollars later, we, we have something. Um, so I don't know how to fix that. Um, the only thing that I have been able to think of is that uh, maybe we should just do some experiments, um, perhaps going back to uh, General Cardone's uh, point uh, or comment is, um, I think we could probably get uh, approval from, uh, well, maybe Congress would be the right place to just try a couple of uh, experiments to see are there, is, is there a different way to, to go about doing this. Um, the last thing um, I just want to uh, comment on, the, just Randy's comment, um, we uh, talk a lot about leveraging industry uh, and certainly that makes a lot of sense. Um, the issue I see that frequently we don't sufficiently uh, consider is <coughs> the unique requirements of the military, uh, because there are actually some there. Um, and so uh, sometimes, regularly, I hear, uh, well, why don't we just buy something from Apple or from uh, Microsoft or from whatever. Um, in some cases, that makes sense, uh, but really if you look at uh, some of the unique uh, requirements of the Army, since uh, we're sitting in Army spaces. Um, they really, uh, you guys, I've noticed, uh, don't tend to operate in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, New York City. In fact, you tend to operate in places that I never heard of before, um, and they're frankly really not very pleasant places. I wish you could you know, choose a little more wisely uh, on where you operate. Um, and so there's frequently not a lot of commercial infrastructure there. So, so there's just different requirements. Uh, just a, a little comment. We will send you to Mosul uh, this afternoon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Randy. I've uh, been the, there. The next question, uh, <laughs> it's a very simple question. It's a very non-technical question. That's why I like it. And it's for General Cardone or General Franz. The primary mission of the Army is to defend the homeland. You guys understand that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please describe the Army's current and future role in the cyber defense of the nation in areas such as critical infrastructure. Yeah, if you could, I'm, I'm going to answer this, but then I want to turn it over to some of these others here for a minute. So uh, it's very clear right now that the Department of Defense only has the authority to defend its own networks, dot mil domain. General Alexander has talked extensively on this. So the dot gov, and I'm, I'm a little broader here is, is uh, Department of Homeland Security, and the dot-com is by private companies. And so the question is, what, if there's ever a giant cyber attack inside the United States, who does what? Because most people will look at the Department of Defense and say, we didn't create you to defend yourself, but that's the way you're organized right now in cyber. Now, uh, I think Admiral Rogers talked this morning about the importance of partnerships, et cetera, but, you know, Nate, I'd like to hear what you have to say and about that, really. I mean, that, that, that's the answer right now. That's we defend the dot mil domain. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts? Sure, I, I'm happy to. Um, I wonder if in the, in, in the context of doing that, maybe, maybe I can just 
foot stomp <coughs> on three things I've heard up here that really resonate with me. Uh, the first, sir, is, is your comment about the imperative to relook everything cyber every three years. And I just say God, Godspeed in doing that because I think that's essential and, uh, uh, and, and really absolutely the right um, philosophical approach. And then uh, Jeff's comment about um, this problems in this domain being increasingly non-delegable, I guess. They're, they're in the corporate space. This is more and more uh, a C-suite issue. And remember, after the target breach, uh, which, speaking of embedded systems, came in through the HVAC system, right? Uh, after the target breach, we saw a public company CEO get fired by his board. So all of a sudden, uh, public company CEOs can't say, oh, this is my CISO's problem, and maybe there's a commander's analog. You will less and less be able to say, this is my six's problem. Um, and then, then third, uh, which really gets to this question, it was, is General Franz's uh, comment from the Army side about the need to uh, build and use open systems. Um, I would say from the industry side of, of, uh, of, of how, uh, what, what should and, and must industry do to help the Army leverage it, uh, <coughs> industry needs to build easy to use tools. Uh, we, we, have a, we have a talent shortage and you know, we, can, we can make long-term investments in STEM education, that's great, um, but we can also tackle it from the other side, which is build tools that don't require a Carnegie Mellon PhD to use. And so uh, that has a couple of benefits, I think, for, for uh, the government customer. First, you end up with a lighter services tail, so you don't have a bunch of expensive people in seats, which is good. Um, and second, you get accelerated time to value. I mean, you're, you're dealing with operators on two or three year rotations, right? I imagine you don't want to spend six months training them. Um, if they can get capable on the tools in, uh, in a few days, um, it just accelerates their, their speed to value. So in, in, in terms of you know, what, what the partnership ought to look like and how, how industry can help with the, uh, with the defense of, of other assets in the country, um, I, I, would, I would focus on a lot of the same points we're hearing here. Um, build open systems. Um, focus on non-proprietary technologies and solutions. Um, build things that are easy to use. HTML5 web apps. You should be able to run a lot of this on an iPad. Uh, it, it should not require an enormous amount of, of clunky, expensive um, uh, back-end infrastructure. Uh, I think you, you need to mask the complexity. Uh, you need to focus on very intuitive visual workflow. Uh, these things have to be useful by human beings. Um, we need to focus on very sophisticated data science and inc increasingly automate um, systems that are tuned to unique environments in order to reduce the number of false positives. The, the first generation of, secu of, of defensive security tools you can, <coughs> you can sort of generally lump under firewall. And they were predicated on the notion that you can keep your adversary out, right? So was the Maginot line. Um, Firewalls are, are, are necessary, but they're not sufficient. The second generation of security tools, you lump them under SIM, the security incident event managers, that for the first time were looking inside your network. But they were primarily historical. They were, they were looking for threats uh, f which, for which the signature already exists in your log. So you might have 25 million uh, logs, but those are by definition all yesterday's threats. So. Uh, the third generation, the next generation of network defense tools, I would argue, sits at the intersection of security and data analytics. And so um, the expectation you ought to have and the challenge I think that, that industry has is to build easy to use, open, scalable tools that sit right at that intersection that have high, a high degree of security maturity, they're purpose built for security, um, and they have massive scalable uh, capacity to do data analytics. You might have Take a shot at that. Please, Jeff. Something I might add uh, to this, even talking to the commercial industry now that we've been doing this kind of approach over the last two years, that their, their own input should probably be heard as well because it used to be different. You know, the commercial industry used to say, I, I, I want an arm's length, maybe a leg's length distance from the government. Um, and I don't understand all this reporting. Uh, but now that you start to see a clearer picture of all, I think we need to challenge ourselves, okay? Because I know what the mission is today, and I appreciate the, the mission. But 
when it comes to ground warfare and somebody's coming over our borders, we don't look to the police department to stop that army. When somebody brings the Navy over, we don't look to the Coast Guard to stop the Navy. Participate, yes, okay? And, and if there's an enemy aircraft inbound, they cross our international border, we don't look for the air traffic control grid to convince them to turn around, okay? Cyber is just an approach. It's just a different approach into the economy, into our political system, um, and what we consider to be national assets. And I think a lot more needs to be considered as you go forward developing your missions. Um, because if the objective truly is a nationally driven objective, <clears throat> okay, so it's not criminal, that's not the regular stuff, it appears to be a national driven objective. That to me fits in the military. That's the military's job. That's just my personal opinion. And I know it's shared by the, the other two that are with us from uh, EY because we spoke about this. So we, we need you to think about that because what is happening is not something, uh, even think about board, board, what shapes a company and their investments in security. If 20 to 30% of some of our company's boards have foreign ownership because it's very easy to buy seats on a board, okay, then those board members can convince the other board members not to protect the company at a certain level, not to add additional investments into security. So you, it's too easy to own commercial industry because we're based on shareholders, right? We're based on shares that are available. And those are the types of things that need to be considered because they want to take out your supply chain. They don't necessarily have to drop a bomb on it anymore. They could buy it. You know, if all of a sudden DHL was bought by Alibaba today, um, I know, Ali, I mean, uh, DHL played a big role when I was in Iraq for two years. They were there all the time. They played a major role in the supply chain. Okay, so those are the types of things that I encourage you to think about. Jeff, thanks. Uh, we're, we're back to you, if, if we could. Uh, this question is, can you, better dis can you better explain the business risk scenario based planning you mentioned and how the organization should apply that, the outcome? Yeah, that, that to us is now the starting point. You know, it's, it, I wish we could take credit and say, wow, that's just something we uh, invented out of nowhere. But if you read any risk management book that goes back in time, it says, you know, understand your business. <laughs> so, and then develop your strategy from there. It's just, it was somehow dropped where it's, it's in our manuals, it's in our standards, D, DOD as well as NIST and, and commercial. Um, but the execution of that is not well understood, right? Because the IT people typically get handled the the microphone during that stage. So what we do is now what we say is we, we need to really understand what the economic and the business scenarios are, why somebody would go into a different company and what the objects, objectives would be. And then once you understand that, then go take a look at how, how, they, how they enter you at the breach stage, what they do at the exploitation stage, at each stage of the attack chain and you develop your strategy really based on that scenario. And it was amazing what started to happen. We used to go in with maturity models. Okay, we used to evaluate an organization based on how well we believe they were mature in all of the different categories of control. Then when you turned it and you asked the same questions, but then you asked the questions and said, okay, now in relationship to, you, you identified one of your top assets as your board book. Okay, that has all of the stuff that would be required to manipulate the company. Let's ask those same questions re related to the scenarios, to the, to the actual scenario of how they're going in today, using real world, this isn't theoretical, how they're doing it today. And all of a sudden you see a lot more red where they thought they were green because that really wasn't an area they protect. Same on pause, right, the point of sell, a target example. If the attack is really to get the pause data and take credit card information, that's one thing, has a different set of controls. But what if to get the, cre the credit card information is just one objective, it's really to manipulate the market, okay? It's really to make you go down so that they can buy, right? They're short selling, okay? And, and or buying control into you. Now I may apply even more funds, okay? And I bet that CEO today would have a whole different opinion on if you just didn't look at it from a career perspective. They lost 20 to 25% of their value during that point in time. When there's somebody selling, somebody's buying. And then you go compare that scenario to, oh, right now there's a particular country out there that in their five year plan really needs to own an American based retailer that somebody trusts. So these are long term plans, right? You, you have to start nudging away at that company's market share 
and the trust so that you can eventually buy it. So that's a scenario. Now you have to go apply the controls based on that, okay? And it actually doesn't cost more, it costs less because you're focusing on the right things. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, this question is addressed to General Cardone, but uh, I would like to expand it out to uh, Dr. Garrett as well from a broader DOD perspective. What is our cyber doing to enhance or encourage STEM education in middle or high schools with an eye towards building a pool of cyber natives who could join up or help the Army cyber enterprise? And there's a lot of work going on in STEM. And General Hernandez started it down there with the uh, Huntsville School Districts. I, I'm passing this off to the Cyber Center of Excellence to be blunt, but I think they, uh, we want to encourage STEM education, but at the same time, we're actually taking a different approach and trying to provide more intern opportunities inside of cyber, working with US Cyber Command. Uh, there's areas that we could impact, and I think that's gonna be a much bigger return on investment than working with lots of other programs with private industry and the government trying to improve STEM education in the country. And I'll, I'll uh, open it back to you, Dr. Garrett. So um, I guess from, I have uh, children who are uh, just starting graduate school um, and I frankly employ a lot of uh, recent uh, graduates from uh, you know, major universities. Um, and I have thought about so what would motivate them uh, to work um, on DOD uh, contracts or for DOD agencies? Um, because there's certainly been times in the past when that occurred. Um, and um, my experience so far is that um, it's really about doing meaningful work. Um, so we have a number of uh, PhDs from places like MIT, Carnegie, Stanford, um, they could easily get jobs in Silicon Valley making more than you know, I can afford to pay them, um, but they'd be doing things like selling ads. Okay, that's profitable, but it's not that fulfilling, right? So uh, the thing I think that we have to offer uh, that um, you know, a commercial enterprise really can't is, um, well, patriotism. Um, why are you guys in uniform, right? So uh, I'm pretty confident uh, that really pretty much every general I've ever met uh, could easily be an executive in a, you know, a, a profitable uh, corporation making lots more money than you make as an army officer. So why'd you do that? Um, I think the same uh, ideas could motivate really anybody. Um, it's part of the, you know, we, we have to put forward, why is this a meaningful thing to do? Uh, the second thing I would offer up, um, you know, uh, we're never going to be able to do the payroll thing, and, and so I, I actually wouldn't put that on the uh, list as something to worry about. The, the, the piece uh, that's a big barrier is, uh, frankly, all the bureaucracy. Um, and really and truly, do we, do we need all of that? I think uh, you already mentioned, um, you know, well, so... If somebody's uh, not able to meet the physical fitness requirements, uh, but they're you know, a genius at network operations, you're not going to hire them because they can't do 10 pull-ups? Hmm, maybe, maybe, re, maybe want to rethink that. Um, and as a person who's worked, uh, is a government employee, uh, just the uh, bureaucracy of being a, a, a government or military employment employee is just you know, frequently staggering. Um, if there were some way to, to minimize that, I think that would dramatically you know, improve quality of life, right? Um, so um, I would vote for those two things. Not so much that um, you know, it would be great if we have uh, uh, partnerships with universities, but, but frankly, we have a lot of those. Um, I think the things that are real big sellers are, first of all, doing relevant work and making it clear to people that what you're doing really, really matters. Um, and then secondly, it sure be nice if you could improve the quality of life by you know, cutting back on the, uh, the, the sort of needless bureaucracy. Absolutely, uh, and, and my uh, quick assessment of this would be this, this uh, problem set for building cyber natives certainly goes beyond the Department of Defense. 
And, uh, and I know in my own company, and I'm sure my colleagues here as well, STEM is a very uh, important aspect. Lots of internships, lots of money expended to work with local schools in Maryland, Virginia especially. And so I, if I could, I'd broaden it now to Nate uh, and, and uh, uh, Jeff, to, from an industry perspective, uh, how you might answer this question. I might have a little different angle. I, I, I agree with everything Dr. Garrett just said. And, and I would add maybe only two more things uh, from the developer perspective that uh, maybe those of you in the room in, in uniform or in the government who employ developers or need to recruit and retain developers, um, in, in addition to, to uh, focusing on the mission and, and, and doing useful work and, and the workplace environment and all that, um, I found with, with our developers that um, it really is a community and they want to contribute back to their community, to open source products in particular. Uh, and so if there's a way for, uh, for you to allow your developers to contribute back to that open source community, um, it, it goes a long way for them in building their own credibility, reputation, career, uh, and, and participating in that broader network of, of uh, developers. And the second thing is, can you, can you actually structure their time to give them some freedom? Uh, innovation tends not to happen on a timeline. And uh, most, I would say best practice in, in most engineering centric technology companies is to give people 10% of their time or 20% <coughs> of their time, some piece of time um, where they're free to do unstructured work on the clock. And uh, some of your best work may come out of that time. I know it does for us. Yeah, I would say, you know, one of the, one of the approaches that we're recommending right now is just this cross training. So you think again, everybody here understands cross training, but you know, bringing IT and IT security people into the same rooms with, uh, like kind of most like our team now. Our team is a cell. Our team has uh, financial auditing, fraud, um, finance, and information security professionals all in it. And it's work. It's a war room environment. <clears throat> so as they're working, they're they're hearing each other and they're putting each other's thoughts on. So it's 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 how you work. So now they're all learning from each other. Um, so they also benefit then from the cross, the, the formal cross training. So when you have a discipline, let's say financial management, and you start teaching the people in accounts payable, uh, that when, when you notice a fraud and it's going out based on this type of attack, let's say it's a session browsing attack or things like that, um, you might not just blow it off and just report it as a normal one. It may be part of something else. So you, you need to communicate with these other people, okay, and then heading, helping them understand how to communicate and set up uh, plans and procedures then that involve everybody because it's amazing what they see when they share data. The, the bad guys know we don't share data well, okay, and they know that we might educate at a technical level or a career level, but not, we don't normally train across, right? So that's one of the things. And then the other would be just the, what we refer to the more as the, the crisis management workshops, where you're able to bring those same types of individuals in and run through, as I mentioned, the business risk scenarios for their industry. If in the government, it would be for their particular domain. Uh, and then when you're running those through, now you're training them to think in the context of the business risk scenario. Now, when they go back to do their job, they actually do understand how that attack is happening today. Because remember, it's always based on real world attacks and the types of indicators and observables they should be alert for, okay? And then that, that constant sharing is what raises the, the real effectiveness level. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next question for General Franz. Admiral Rogers said earlier this morning that cyber attack decision-making needs to be retained at higher operational slash strategic levels, vice tactical. How does that square with the fact that cyber enemies are often at the tactical slash asymmetric level? So, so to be clear, he said division and above. So okay. we would define that differently. Yeah. So I think, again, part of, I'm sure part of Admiral Rogers' answer is about where you sit. So as his, in his position as, as Commander U.S. Cyber Command, Director NSA, because of the way that the effects are currently laid out, because of the current planning, because of the current framework, that decision making is kept at a fairly high level in the current environment and the current operations that we're, we're either doing or planning to do. So I think that's the framework of today. I, I think what he probably didn't, and I, and I won't speak for Admiral Rogers, but my sense is that, that 
there will be times, and we have to put in place processes to push that decision making down to the lower levels where it's relevant, but the circumstance has to be such that we need to do that. And so I, I, I've heard over the past couple of years this notion of, well, do you need the capability for the Army to have effects to be able to do things down at the brigade or the battalion level? And, my, and the answer is probably, but we've got to define what is it that a brigade battalion commander needs to do how can you tie, and, and for the most part, whatever they're going to need to do down at that lowest tactical level is still going to be enabled by an enterprise, a, a system that's behind them that may be squarely tied to the national level. I, again, I can take my experience you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan with signals intelligence where you had that capability to affect a target pushed down to the squad level, but that team that was supporting at the squad level was tied right back to the national cryptologic platform the authorities by which that team was operating were clearly understood by the team and the whole chain of command back to the director of NSA. And so we were able to push the effects down to a level where the decision making for employment was at that platoon squad level. They had clear authorities. They knew what they could do. They knew what they couldn't do. Their capability existed, supported by a national, frankly, a national level system. Take that same analogy and apply it to the cyber domain where the effects, those things we may want to do with a tactical cyber formation in the future, could be operated in much the same way, tied to an enterprise with clear understanding of authority, so decisions are made at the right place based on the effect, but you can support, again, the, the network is such that you can support from, you know, national to tactical in fairly, almost real time, again, it's the right framework, it's the right C2, it's understanding the environment and the capability. So, I, and I'm sure he, you know, if he thinks about a ship, there are capabilities on ships that a tactical commander can employ, again, understanding capability, authority, and, and the environment. Oh, great answer. Great. I, and I, if Jen Buckner was on the panel, I think she would have, you know, a very similar answer there. Sir, any comments on that? Okay, great. This next question is for you, sir. Does our cyber have a cyber's capability document? If so, can it be shared with industry? I did not ask that question. So the answer is yes, but I have to check its classification. And we are also, back to my earlier comment about turning uh, as we learn, the capabilities documents have to turn at the same pace. And so I'd have to go back. I have to take that as a do out. I, I don't, I know we have a capabilities document that's working its way through TRADOC into the Army. Now, as to <coughs> current, does that capabilities document represent what we're trying to do today based on what we've learned over the last 12, 18 months? I'm less confident in that given what we started to do with big data analytics, what we started to do with defensive cyberspace operations infrastructure, which is uh, working with our regional cyber centers and how we baseline their tools and how that all interfaces. I'm not sure that's in there. Yeah. So I'll take it as a do out. Well, this is, I think, sir, uh, if you would agree, I think this is a great question for General Brown, I mean, uh, CAC commander. So he's he helps work those uh, kinds of uh, capability documentations, and I, I would ask uh, whoever asked that question to address that with General Brown and his team as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, sir, back to you. Uh, clever businessman has written this one. If the focus has been low risk for programs, then how come 84% of ACAT-1 programs are deemed unsuccessful by GAO, the vast majority of which were awarded on best value basis, not low price, technically, technically acceptable? Seems like we fail often enough already, just big after billions spent. Per your comments earlier, seems like a shift to smaller experiments to fail fast and learn as much as possible to apply the next time. Right, so I think the, I think the answer, that's really what I'm after, um, is, is what's on the end there. I, I think, So in a broader context, I think part of the problem is, so, you know, I came to cyber from an infantry division. I grew up in the operational side. I get lots of people that come show me really neat things. I don't know if they're cutting edge or not. I really don't. And what I think we have to do, and I think this is a problem in, in uh, uh, DOD acquisition writ large. I mean, I see numerous reports where uh, you look at the technology that we're fielding after 10 years and you realize this technology is actually now 10 years old that we're now just fielding. And, and yet it's a successful or not successful depending on how you define that. So 
uh, I think a series, especially in this space, because a lot of it, you know, as we move to this idea of code as infrastructure, which is the direction all this is moving, uh, it, could be, it could be changed even faster than it's changing now. And so I think we have to have lots of experience, harness the power of the workforce, and also harness the power of all this private uh, innovation that's going on. You know, I'm, some of you have heard me say this before, I think we're sitting on a technology revolution right now. And uh, I would be very hesitant to predict what this will look like two or three years from now, and not just in information technology, but in nanotechnologies and other things that have direct application to the military. So how do we harness this for the future? I do want to use this opportunity to say something, though, So, because this is a network and cyber conference, but we take the network as a baseline. But if you think a lot about what we're talking about up here, we've talked about the use of data, which we talk about network, but we don't often talk about cloud, data security, and all this. Yet when we're rapidly approaching, like, the network's the device. Mm -hmm. It's really all about the data. Mm -hmm. And then how do you operationalize all this? And that is the kind of the next step. And we're, and we're with General Pharrell, we're finally getting to the point that we have a, we have a network that is uh, reliable. You know, I, I also talk about it's robust enough that we can operate while compromised, uh, which, you know, I, I refer to Target. Target didn't shut down when they got compromised. They just told people they were. So uh, how do we, how do we work this as we go forward? I think this is an area, uh, you know, cloud technologies, the DOD has had a very hard time below the classified levels of building cloud architectures. Mm -hmm. We still don't have them yet. Look what's going on in private industry. And so, you know, we're consolidating data centers into larger data centers, but do we evolve that to cloud? No, we've kind of done it this way. So we have a, we have a, a lot of work to do in this space here. So. I think the end is, the, the statement on the end here is exactly right. I mean, if we had a, you know, where are the 10 cloud experiments right now on little things that we think we can scale, and then how would we do it? Yeah, so great. Uh, Nate or, and or Jeff, uh, there are no NIEs in industry. How do you guys fail fast and recover and absorb the losses and move forward, uh, if you could? Not well. <laughs> yes. Uh, again, we'd like to say it's commercial, so it's easy to, to, to fail and get going. Um, but it's a performance-based environment, too. So if you fail and it impacts operations, that's going to stick with you. Um, so you're able to have, uh, what I would say, a quick turnaround, even our group. We work on 90-day cycles on everything. We, we're, we, we've, we apply the entire agile development uh, process in everything that we do. So we, we will fail normally in a 30-day increment, so that's not noticed as much. It's that if you go a full year, you got a full investment out there, you fell at that point in time, it's, it's, it's hard to recover. Uh, so I would say stick to the, the shorter turnarounds. Uh, one, one of my favorite Churchill quotes is uh, that success is the ability to move from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> and uh, I think that, uh, I mean, look, we're, we're talking about a radically different scale. It's, it's pretty easy to do in a 110-person tech company. Um, and, and I'm really leery of, of you know, standing here and claiming to offer lessons that work at, at Army scale. But uh, m maybe a lot of it is actually already embedded in your small units. Uh, I mean, we don't do anything different from an infantry platoon. You know, we, we, we try something aggressively, and then we sit down afterwards, and we talk about what worked and what didn't work and we change a little bit for the next time. Um, same, same basic proposition. Well, uh, and again, you made the point, I think that you, know, you need to apply 10, 20, whatever, some percentage of your time to have people go on. I think, I, again, what we're trying to establish, I know General Alexander tried to establish this now, Admiral Rogers at Cybercom, is to, we've got to be a little more deliberate, but we have to deliberately set aside time to think and fail separate from some of those operational things, and we've got, you know, Cybercom now has a cyber imagineering lab, a place where, and it's, it's overwritten, partnered with NSA, it's a place where we can experiment, very, kind of very focused things, but they're, they're expected to fail. It, mm -hmm. And it's set aside, again, it doesn't impact on operational capability, but the other thing is whatever comes out of this, the experiments going on there will feed the force. It'll, it, you know, there's a reason to do it. Right. 
but it's, it's resources and assets set aside deliberately to give us the chance to fail and not be catastrophic, obviously we can't do that. Mm -hmm. So Nate, the, go ahead. The, yes, sir, I, and I think I've got a soft piece to this. We have units, special mission units, with, with an acquisition authority and the mission to test and develop weapons. And you get this small-scale experimentation. You get freeze-dried plasma. You get some real innovations that, that uh, through agreements, and it, this is where it gets a little bureaucratic, but you can, you can transfer that to a larger force, and then you can bring it up and, and develop a, uh, uh, you know, a more DOD or more Army perspective. So I, I, I think there are some little unique DOD models out there for how you can do that on a smaller scale and then, and then apply it to a larger kind of if I could just add one one more thing here. So we're pretty agile now because we're in full contact. I think every, so there's a tremendous amount of innovation because every day you get a new attack. So mm -hmm. I, actually, I had a long time span on that. But the, uh, so we have innovation through contact. But, you know, I, I was struck by what uh, David DeWalt said, now Mandy and FireEye said once, he goes, you know, like malware and antivirus, they're kind of lined up. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you get them, we have, a, we have a whole structure that works that. What I'm worried about of this, uh, what I think you talked about it, Nate, which was a disruption. You know, something that comes in that's totally new, that's, that gets surprised in the space that somebody just dreamed up. Mm -hmm. That's one, and then the, uh, that's the negative side, but then there's also the positive side. What about the thing where somebody dreamed up that gives us a tremendous asymmetrical advantage. I mean, you know, the uh, the iPhone has done more to to influence social media. You know, combine that with a a Google browser and combine that with a few other things. And there's connectivity like we've never seen mm -hmm. that we're still trying to figure out. How do we? What is the implications <coughs> of national security? But what that's today. What what is the one that's in the next couple of years? And how do we not be far behind that? I mean, knowing what we know today about the impact of social media in Arab Spring, I think I could have a lot of meetings with State Department and others. We might have a little different approach in the way that yep. we did this, yep. right? So how do, uh, and not that we had to do anything, but we would have thought about it differently. And I think these are some of the things that we really have to look at in the future. And all this is coming through uh, IT and cyber uh, streams. Thanks, sir. Next question's for uh, Mike. Uh, since you purchased your 1950 Chevy, <laughs> what kinds of lessons has SOCOM, and I'll just maybe focus that down towards uh, USASOC or, or, or SF Command, learned about integrating cyber with tactical soft forces? Yeah, I, I, I think it goes back to that scalable uh, uh, kind of model. It, it, it doesn't come cheap and it doesn't come easy. Uh, I mean, I think if you look at an SF company, it is uh, equipment-wise and largely electronic and communications equipment uh, equivalent to a much lar larger regular uh, unit. So that's why you really got to think about this scalable uh, ability to, again, put these small forces forward. I, I, and I will tell you, one. I think one of our biggest challenges has been the uh, mission control just of soft in general, and not, not that we can't do it, it's organizationally, I mean, we're structured to the 06 level, but some of these are very sensitive operations. Some of these take larger, um, you know, shoulders to, to put a problem upon, and, and uh, you know, we don't have enough 06s to go around out into some of these forward elements to, to command. So you gotta, you gotta, you know, there's an organizational piece that, that goes into that. And then, of course, just resourcing it and maintaining it and, and keeping it going. Uh, so the logistics of the, uh, of the adventure. Um, I, think, I think that's... Uh, yeah, 